This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Welcome to The Commercial Investing Show, where we analyze, explain, and exploit the opportunities presented in today's commercial property marketplace. If you're interested in apartments, mobile home parks, self-storage facilities, and other income property, you've come to the right place. We'll explore what's hot and what's not in markets nationwide in the relentless pursuit of return on investment. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. It's my pleasure to welcome back a returning guest, but he's out with a new book, and I can't wait to hear more. It's Patrick H. Donahoe, and he is the author of Heads I Win, Tales You Lose, a financial strategy to reignite the American dream. Patrick, welcome back. How are you? Hey, Jason. I'm great. I'm great, man. It's uh, good to be back on. It's great to have you. So, you know, I love the title. Uh, You know that I'm uh, into this title and want to use it for my future documentary because I think it's really true. It's this sort of uh, paradigm in the financial system that makes it hard for the middle class or the upper middle class investor to win. Certainly hard for the poor. I won't even mention that. Um, But uh, what do we do about this? I mean, in the book, you talk about the purpose perpetual wealth strategy and kind of how you came to understand the financial system. So uh, take a dive into that for us. It's such a broad subject, Jason, you you and I have talked about this uh, so much. And so I'm sure the listeners can resonate, but you're right. There's this, not just the perpetual wealth strategy or or real estate or, you know, these tools or investments as solutions, I think is part of it. What I really have found in, in my experience is that a person's you know, really perspective of of life and of what America is and, you know, what their role in the overall scheme of thing is, it has really been influenced and tainted from its original idea, right, which was the idea of Americanism. And that's where, you know, I would say it's continued on and compounded. And today, the average person has delegated, you know, pretty much their entire life to the government, to Wall Street, to third parties to provide for their well-being. And, you know, we all know that they have done a terrible job at it, given the the statistics. And so the idea behind the book is, you know, really to, you know, not have this, you know, um, you know second American revolution, right, but is to get people to really start to think about, you know, the roots of what created just an, an amazing place to live. And it really is a blessing for anybody that's born in America. But really the, the reasons and the principles behind why it became what it is. And then once I think you understand those principles, right, of freedom, of responsibility, of entrepreneurism, then you can kind of see the forest for the trees and essentially take steps to take back control over what, you know, whether it's, you know, intentional or unintentional, uh, given to uh, government, whether it's social security, whether it's, uh, you know, the, the responsibility for roads and military and, uh, you know, providing jobs or whatever the narrative is, right? But it's taking back control and understanding that you're the one that can create a tremendous amount of freedom for yourself if you have the right perspective and paradigm. Yeah, absolutely. I love the way you said it. I haven't heard anyone say it quite that way before, how Americans just delegate their financial future to Wall Street and the government. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, of course, I understand that they do that. But I I don't think I've ever heard anybody say they delegate it. And and that's, that's true. That's really, really interesting. And, um, you know, one of the rules of delegation is if you delegate, you got to hold them accountable, right? Uh (laughs) You know, you got to follow up and make sure the job is getting done. But it's not getting done in this case. And so what are people to do? I mean, you've, you look at we've got a social security system that is obviously insolvent. Everybody knows that Bernie Madoff said he got the idea for his Ponzi scheme from the social security social system, system. <laughs> which I think is very telling. And then we've got Wall Street. And look, Wall Street is great for Wall Street. They're not great for the investors, though. That old uh, funny, well, it's not very funny, but that old sad joke about where are all the clients' yachts, you know? Um, the, the, the broker takes his buddy down to the, the harbor and says, that's my yacht, that's my friend's yacht, that's my other friend's yacht at another brokerage, you know? 
where are all the clients' yachts? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> well, and this and this goes to the overarching narrative, right? And and, I, and that's where I I try to be as clear as possible in the book is that we've been conditioned to want to you know retire this whole idea of, of retirement, and I don't think that that alone is the issue. It's the the sense or the lifestyle that will give us if we achieve it. And that's where I start to peel back and say, number one, it's not reasonable. I mean, if it was reasonable, then a lot of people would be retired right now and people are, aren't just aren't. And, uh, you know, the financial side of things show that they're never going to be able to retire, at least talking of the majority. But I believe that the drive behind wanting to, you know, save for the future and defer, you know, money right now for future purpose is to achieve freedom. Right. And that's freedom to do what you want to uh, have leisure time and not necessarily, you know, do something you don't like sacrificing time right now for that end result. So what I try to do in the book is to explain that, you know, especially in our day and age, there's so many ways in which you can achieve that right now. Now, it may not be, you know, some of the financial definitions of the circle that we we run in of, you know, you have more passive income than your expenses. I don't think that's all part of this freedom equation. I really believe that people are, you know, meant to produce and provide meaningful work, meaningful value to I others. I love that. I love it. I love what you're saying. I really agree with that. It's uh, a... Yeah. You know, one of the reasons maybe people have trouble saving for retirement, I don't know if anybody talks about this too much, but is maybe deep down, they don't really want to retire. I know I don't. There's a lot of meaning that comes from work. I mean, heck, we spend more than a third of our lives engaged in the task of work. Mm -hmm. It better have some meaning, right? Of course. And that's the irony is that I think people like to work, but they hate what they do for work. Oh, that, and that's, yeah, very good distinction. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and that's and that's the trade off, right? They're they're sacrificing something they don't like to do, right, for this future where they don't have to do it. Mm -hmm. And that's where I would say, you know, with the amount of evolution in our society, right, of you know, re remote working, contract work, consulting, I try to you know talk a a lot can discover what that meaningful work is, right? And I, and I believe that there are gifts that we have, there's talents, there's abilities, that when we do those things, we're the happiest. But I'd also would argue that that's where you're going to be the most productive and provide the most value for other people. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not an overnight thing, right? This is a, it's a, it's a, uh, you know, you're always making uh, progress toward that. But it's at least, you know, focusing there as opposed to focusing to this like future day in which you don't have to do what you hate doing. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's the idea of the book is really if you can shift your perspective now, what you do today, whether it's your investments, whether it's where you save, uh, where you spend your leisure time starts to adjust, right? Once that end vision changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Very good. Okay. So we talked about some of these sort of mindset or psychological issues relating to the topic. Let's talk about some of the financial issues. Where is the world now? We, we kind of vaguely mentioned it, you know, Wall Street government, that's what we delegate to. Uh, and what do we need to be doing? The first thing is, I would say, look at the actual statistics of the monstrosity, the behemoth that's been created to fulfill, you know, this end result of, of freedom, right? So some of the stats I put in the book, you know, are average returns of investors. So there's a group out of Northeast that uh, is called Dalbar Research. Mm -hmm. And, you know, returns for a diversified portfolio are a little over two and a half percent. And then if you look at, you know, and this is for, that was for the last 15 years. But if you look at inflation, Right. And you take you're, that you're into getting consideration. Killed. It's, yeah. it's more than that. It's so it's, it's yeah. people are not getting people are not getting ahead. Right. And then you have, you know, the pension crisis, which is I think is, is pretty fascinating, especially with, you know, some of the smaller municipalities that are going bankrupt and the actual court cases and laws, you know, that I, I mean, it, it's going to be really interesting to see how the pension crisis uh, falls out because it's a, you know, with federal government and municipalities, it's like a seven trillion dollar underfunded uh, issue, right, which is just in, insane. So I think you look at all these and there's a lot more statistics, but it all plays into that same narrative. Right. And this is it's this idea of one day I'm going to be free and not have to work. And so that's where, again, it comes down to 
if you realize that the system's broken and it's not going to work, number one, there's other issues, right, where you have to have correction. And you know, you're going to have correction in the, in, in the future. Who knows when? But you, you, know, you mean, you mean market yet. correction? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, pension. If you're underfunded by, you know, seven, eight trillion dollars and all these municipalities, I mean, that's a lot of money. For sure. <laughs> and to fix that problem, it's not this like the politicians or lawmakers know how to like flip this switch, flip this switch and flip this switch and we're good. Right. Then you add, you know, Social Security to the mix, Medicare to the mix. There's major issues. Right. And mm-hmm. so there's stuff that's going to happen that is going to you know, make the problem even even worse, which is even more reason to try to figure out right now. OK, you know, what is it that uh, you can do to yep. to be more free, find meaningful work and make more money? And then with that money, invest in different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. so what should people be doing? I mean, we know there's a correction coming. Uh, We don't know exactly when. Nobody knows whenever. That's the problem. But we know it's coming. We know that Wall Street will find a way to cheat us out of our money. Uh, I saw a really interesting article that you would have liked uh, in maybe it was the Wall Street Journal. I don't know. Maybe it was USA Today. I'm not sure about how how you're making your returns are a lot lower with your stockbroker than you think they are. And mm-hmm. they went over, you know, this whole like scenario of when the money's in cash, when it's in the market. It, really interesting. But we, I think most people know there's a problem. You know, the jig is up. <laughs> you know, so it, it, that's a good thing. It is. I don't know if it, people know how to identify yeah. identify it. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And you know, the statistics are all around us. I mean, we can point to a million of them. I'm hoping the book really has that impact. And it's not this attacking, like the world's going to end, you know, Peter Schiff type of book, right? right? It's one of, uh, or Jim Rickers, it's one of those books where it's like, listen, the idea of people, humans, is that we're good at solving problems, right? Mm -hmm. And when there's major catastrophes and problems, okay, that's when we thrive. And I'm hoping that once these you know, major, major issues start to unwind that, you know, human beings can step in and and start to solve, solve some of these problems. Okay. So the issue is it's different for each individual, but I would just take the rose colored glasses off and really look at reality and the state of things right now. Uh, And then as far as what you can do right now, okay, it's not necessarily anything that applies to that overarching narrative, whether it's putting money into a 401k, putting money into the stock market, putting money away that's deferred that you can't touch without penalty or tax. Okay, you have to shift where you're putting money. Also, it comes down to, right, how do you essentially become more independent from your employer if you're if you're employed, right? And what that means is you start to identify your skill sets, your talents, your abilities, and then start to pursue the maximization of those things where you can essentially be either more valuable to your employer, but also recognize your value in the marketplace. Yeah, Ab, that is such a good point. I'm so glad you brought that up. You know, people need to think, even if they have a a traditional day job. They need to think like a free agent. You need to think like a vendor and understand that your employer is your customer yes. and you want to keep your customer happy, but you also want to maximize your revenue. Uh, mm-hmm. So, you know, it is a balance between those two. But instead of thinking like, hey, I'm going to just, you know, do the minimum I can do to get by and not get fired. Think of it like you are running a company, <laughs> you know, like be an entrepreneur, an yep. entrepreneur if you're not an entrepreneur. Excellent point. And that's where I would say you look at the trade off, the exchange and inherently okay, you're worth more than what your employer pays you. Right. Because the, the employer has to make a profit. You have to be. Well, you're not always worth more than what they pay you, but hopefully you are. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and they would <laughs> and, fire and, you. And, and mean, the metric is would... hopefully three times. You should be yeah. worth at least three times what they pay you. Yeah. And that's the thing is I would you know step back and look at it from both sides, because if you look at yourself and you say, I'm I'm uh, important and I, you know, make a difference and I'm you know, my employer should pay me three times what he's paying me. You have to look at what you're getting paid. Okay, and recognize that, okay, you're getting paid for the value that you produce. Okay, if that's all you're getting paid and your employer won't pay you more if you go and request it, then that's indicative that you may not be doing or be in the position to make more money. You have to find different positions, employers. And right now, you know, there are so many resources online where you can start to look at positions, pay, and then also the requirements and the training and certification. 
I tell kids, you know, that are in my neighborhood and are good at math, I'm like, you should just, you know, you should uh, quit high school and go and, you know, there's a couple. I, I'm sure of, their parents love you for that. <laughs> I know they don't. And it's, 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 it's the point, though, of I talk to them about developers, right? Software right. developers or website developers or game developers. Mm-hmm. And there are, you know, a number of education sites and companies here in Utah yep. that they can spend all their time doing that and they'll be able to get a six figure job before they even leave high school, mm-hmm. right? So the idea is there's a lot of opportunities out there. You have to, you know, take your head out of the sand, right? And start to look around you at, okay, what do I like doing? What am I good at? And then how can I maximize those skills? And then where can I look to in the marketplace to find opportunities to make more money, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that mindset, it's not this one time you do it and then you're, you're set for life, right? It's, it's more of a mindset where you're always looking at yourself. You're always looking at what can I do to be more valuable to somebody else and how do I scale that? And that right there, I, I believe, provides a meaning that doesn't exist in most employment these days. Mm-hmm. But it also produces a tremendous amount of money and fulfillment. And then I would believe you know, that would create this dynamic of freedom because mm-hmm. you're essentially doing something that uh, you love doing and you're getting paid for it. And right there, I would say if, if you can have that mentality, depending on what the market does or society does or or how jobs change or technology changes, you can pivot, right, and essentially be in the position, again, heads I win, tails you lose, be in the position so that you can always be valuable and know exactly how to get the exchange of that value, which is money. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great, great, great points. Okay, you have a chapter in the book. Well, there's a couple chapters I want to ask you about. One about myths and truths of insurance, but the other one, save, borrow, invest, and build wealth. And, you know, you know that there's one of those things in that equation that people often misinterpret, and it's the borrowing, obviously, right? Yeah. But do you want to start with the insurance? Well, let's go. Let's hit the borrowing first because sure. it ties perfectly into insurance because what we're taught to do is essentially the opposite of what we should do, mm-hmm. right? Because if you look at the narrative of this end result of retirement, it's pay off all your debts, pay off your house, and, you know, have uh, income coming from your 401k for the rest of your life supplemented by social security and you're good. But I pro- I actually prove mathematically in the book that in order to do that, you would have to save 50% of your income just to keep the lifestyle that you have. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, if you do. follow that model. Mm-hmm. So the idea is our in, you know, the entire country, if you really think about it, is based in debt. That is our, our monastery systems foundation is debt. Mm-hmm. And so if you're trying to not have debt, immediately you're you're behind. Mm-hmm. And so the idea of leverage is you play into the, you know, the game and the economy of government and and business, right? Businesses, what what is a bond? A bond is debt. That's how they raise money. So when they build a business and create all of their pricing, it started with debt. Therefore, the pricing, okay, is influenced by debt. So if you look at really, you know, whether it's a Me- house meaning or the pricing of their widgets, their products, right? Correct. Yeah, Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Right. Sure. It's all based on debt. And then all real estate, automobiles, all pricing is based on debt. And then the subsequent you know, payments are really what people use to determine whether they can afford something or not. Okay. Okay. So in other words, in, in maybe a broader sense, the capital stack that created that business that sells that product that we are buying, uh, the debt is priced into that product, of course, yes. right? Yeah. Correct. Okay, so what does that mean, though? Like, you know, I get that when, when I buy a property, right, and I buy it from someone who rehabbed it or built it brand new, they had to buy the land, they had to, you know, or buy the house that needed fix up, and they had to finance it and pay interest on that financing and so yeah. forth. They had to pay for that debt. So yeah. I have to pay them back for that debt and then some in order to be able to buy it. So that's part yeah. of the, the whole stack of the value chain. Uh, but the but, pricing yeah. is based in debt, right? right. If okay. there was no debt available, right, would you pay $250,000 for the medium home price? No, right? because it's a credit-based asset and, and that the credit makes it cheap. And that's the point, right, is people are told to pay off all of their debts, right, and not carry that. And they just don't get ahead. You can't get ahead in, in a debt-based society by doing that. Very good point. Yeah, you will always be behind the eight ball if you try it's like that old saying, you know, don't take a knife to a gunfight, right? That's that's yeah. what you're really doing, you know. Yeah. If you're going to be uh, have this old 
school mentality that says, oh, I'm not going to use debt. And I always say debt's my favorite four letter word. <laughs> okay. yeah. uh, if I'm not going to use debt, then you will be handicapped. You will be there, you know, with your weak position in a world of people that are using debt in a powerful, positive way, uh, investment grade debt to do more and achieve more with their uh, portfolio. Absolutely. And that's, and that's the point is once you get your head around that, you're going to realize that the narrative is really, you know, to be smart with your money, not to get rid of debt. Yeah. Right. And be smart with your money is understanding, you know, a financial statement, understanding uh, assets, liabilities, understanding cash flow. And if you're in that position, you have that education. Debt doesn't matter, really. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, debt will be used if there's that understanding Debt will be used to purchase productive assets. And the only way you're going to do that is if they cash flow and make sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. But that's another issue. But it, yeah. it kind of plays into the insurance side of things. Okay. And, you know, it's not insurance for insurance sake, but it's what insurance gives you. And, and we're talking permanent insurance, but it gives you essentially uh, a, a vehicle that supports our narrative, which is achieving financial freedom as soon as possible. And the reason why it does that is because, number one, it has a degree of certainty that doesn't exist really in the marketplace. It may exist in a savings account or a checking account, but you don't earn anything there. Right. And also those are accounts that they're garnishable. Uh, you know, you could be sued and have them taken, you know, if you don't. Right. So, so the idea of, in, you know, insurance, number one, is that it yields better than any type of guaranteed savings account. But then at the same time, if you factor in the tax benefits, it outperforms most uh, investment accounts or diversified portfolios. So the idea is that that type of asset as a foundation okay, allows you to store capital, get a good return, have a degree of certainty that reduces anxiety, mitigates fear, okay, and allows you to be more productive in pursuing that meaningful work, that thing, that position that's going to make you the happiest but make you the most amount of money. And then, you know, once you start to layer in, and actually I, I talked about you in the in the book, Jason, where you layer in other investments on top of that. That's merely, you know, the foundational asset as far as, you know, our, our strategy is concerned. And then it has a, a loan provision with the insurance company. Again, this is the principle of leverage where your money keeps growing. You have your account there, but the insurance company with their other monies will lend to you against your growing account. So you essentially have a line of credit against that account to acquire, whether it's investment property, whether it's buying a business or a franchise, whatever the case may be. So that's the idea of insurance. Okay. Okay, good. I want to go back to one thing that you said that I think was important. So, so many of our clients ask when they, you know, they want to build big real estate portfolios and have a lot of investments and they get all caught up. And I, you know, I've noticed in this whole asset protection it's a rabbit hole. You could just go down that rabbit hole forever and never be finished, right? It's an endless thing. And they get so caught up in it. And yet they've got all this money sitting in a savings account <laughs> that's doing nothing for them. Now, of course, they're getting destroyed by taxes and inflation, inflation right? Yeah. Those are just eating your money. It's ridiculous. But not only that... Like you said, it's garnishable. You know, you can levy a bank account. If you have a creditor come at you someday, they can just walk into the bank with a paper from the courthouse and, you know, hey, give me this guy's money. You know, <laughs> that's basically how it works. And no, I, I uh, remember and it, back in so, 2008, yeah. 2009, I mean, I had some really, really uh, hard times. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't alone. There's a lot of, you know, clients and people that I was uh, don't, working don't, with. Don't worry, you had millions of people to keep you company at that time. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. And that's where they learned firsthand <laughs> that, you know, what a judgment is, right? right? Yep. What a bank or a credit. And that's yep. the, that's what really, you know, made me this very pessimistic toward banking institutions who yeah. received, you know, they caused the problem in the first place and oh, they got all money yeah. to solve the problem. Yeah. And then they went after people, right? Right. right. And they well, were suing people like for $500 or credit cards, yeah, $1,000 credit cards. I know. I, know. I, know. I mean, that, that's another, the, the banking another system story. is so disgustingly crooked. It's unbelievable. Yep. I used to, I used to not say that, but the thing that made me really understand it is when I under, started understanding the concept of, you know, studying the Federal Reserve and the 
way the whole system works, the way Goldman Sachs works, and the way they create these cycles in the economy so they can benefit from them. They let the dumb money come in and run up the asset prices. They loan it to them. And then they shock the system and the value dissipates because these are credit-based assets. And then they give everybody bad credit scores. They sue them. They put judgments against them and they mess up their lives. And most of these people buy into the idea, you know, I look at I, before I studied this, I used to think, oh, these are just irresponsible people that don't pay their debts, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but then I then I read the book, and I talked about it on my show. I don't know if you heard that episode, Debt, the First 5,000 Years. It's not that simple, folks, okay? It's not that simple. Like, I used to think it was that simple. And what they do is then the big financial institutions and, and the, the banksters, they then loan money to these people again, again. to inflate yeah. the next cycle, <laughs> but they've given them all bad credit scores. So they, they think, well, that's why I've got to pay a higher interest rate. That's why I've got to pay more fees. They make it like their fault. And it's sometimes it is their fault but a lot of times it's not okay you know, you know it's just the way the system it's works. the car it's the cards that they were dealt right yeah yeah no it's it's really it's really a scam yeah absolutely well, and it's one of those the system is so big right and it's been going on for you know over a so hundred oh, yeah. over a hundred years right now and i think there are good things right to the amount of credit and debt that's been created because you know, you have entrepreneurs, you have businesses sure. that have been able to innovate and create great deal of efficiency in our economy as far as, you know, transportation, communication, food, et cetera. Now, obviously, there's has been some unintended consequences to that. But the, you know, the idea is for the individual that's on the boots on the ground, they've been, you know, have had the wool pulled over their eyes thinking that what they're doing is a good thing when in reality it's fueling this this system. And so the idea is to, you know, take the wool over your eyes, start to look at things differently, educate yourself and start to focus on now as opposed to this distant, you know, mirage in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. Good point. Anything else you want to say as we wrap it up, Pat? Go get the book. I mean, it, it's a it took me a long time to do it, put a lot of effort into it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an audio book as well. Mm -hmm. I think you'll enjoy it. I, I was told by some mentors that if you don't have a book under 150 pages, like nobody's going to read it. Uh -huh. I couldn't fit what I wanted to put in the book into 150 pages. Yeah. So you know, so it was it was written in a way that you know I've seen people read it in one sitting. Right, and yeah. they'd uh, you know stay in their car and stay. it's gotten a good response so far, and, mm -hmm. and uh, I think people will learn at least one or two things from it. Absolutely. Uh, maybe not everything, but a couple things. Absolutely. Good stuff. Uh, and I wish you a lot of success with it. The book is Heads I Win, Tails You Lose, A Financial Strategy to Reignite the American Dream by Patrick Donahoe. Pat, before you go, give out your website. Sure. The website for the book and has all my contact information in there is headsortailsiwin.com. Heads or tails I win dot com. Great, great domain name, heads or tails I win dot com. Fantastic. Pat Donahoe, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Jason. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, heartmanmedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own. And if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.